Hello, welcome to Industry Reactions. Industry Reactions is a weekly briefing on industry events, changes, and future trends that impact your business. We're your hosts, Rick Honer and Mark Friedel from ChemPoint. You can find Industry Reactions on YouTube, LinkedIn, and as a podcast. For those watching on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button, ring that notification bell, and smash that like button. We plan on discussing issues that impact the global industry and help you uncover new opportunities. We hope this will provide market intelligence that will keep you ahead of changing conditions. U.S. chemical production continues to show steady improvement. The U.S. chemical production regional index rose 0.9% in October, following a 0.8% gain in September and a 1% increase in August, according to the American Chemistry Council. During October, chemical output expanded in all regions with the largest gains occurring in the Northeast region. The chemical production regional index is measured on a three month moving average basis. It's good to see some positive movement there. The chemical activity barometer, a leading economic indicator, which is also created by the American Chemistry Council, rose 0.8% in November on a three month moving average basis. This is following a 1% gain in October. On a year-over-year -year basis, the barometer fell 2.4% in November. The unadjusted data show a 1.3% gain in November following a 0.5% gain in October and a 0.7% gain in September. The CAB has four main components, each consisting of a variety of indicators, production, equity prices, product prices, and inventories and other indicators. Due to its early position in the supply chain, chemical industry activity has been found to be consistently lead the U.S. economy's business cycle, and the barometer can be used to determine turning points and likely trends in the broader economy. With seven straight months of gains, the November CAB reading is consistent with the recovery in the U.S. economy. So basically, in a nutshell, we're still below 2019, but steadily gaining every month for the last seven months. Yeah, that sounds about right. And these two reports are, are fairly consistent. North American Weekly Chemical Rail maintains year-over-year -year gains. Chemical rail car traffic in North America continued to strengthen during the week ending November 21st. Weekly volume totaled nearly 45,000 carloads up 5.8% year over year and up 0.6% sequentially, according to data released on November 25th by the Association of American Railroads. Looks like rail, railroad uh, um, rail traffic or, or chemical rail is following a similar trend. Good to see. Yeah. So on to Europe, production of chemicals in the EU showed signs of recovery in the third quarter 2020 with an increase of 61.1% compared with an 8.7% decline in the second quarter. This is according to Suffolk's latest quarterly report. In the first nine months of the year, EU chemical production dropped 4.4% year on year. Overall, EU manufacturing output fell sharply by 10.6% year over year, with automotive output losing more than 28%. However, Suffolk is down on the European chemical industry performance running into the year end, highlighting the seriousness of the second wave of the COVID-19 outbreak and its ex expected impact. Most chemical companies operating in the region were trying to be positive too pointing to the fact that October had been better than September. Forward visibility was limited, however, although there was a sense that, for petrochemicals at least, a typical fourth quarter lull might not be seen this year because of reduced inventory and more just-in-time buying. These reports, however, were made as second wave lockdowns began to bite. Chemical rail car loading, said to be the best real-time indicator for chemical industry activity, fell 2.2% in the week ending uh, November 14th, and we're down 4.4% on a year-to-date basis. Loadings had been rising for six months of the previous 13 weeks. Yeah, it seems like we're seeing some similar trends in North America, hopefully, um, at least with the inventories and just-in-time buying patterns, hopefully, uh, we don't see a similar trend as far as some of the slowdowns. China 
to take oil refining crown held by the U.S. since the 19th century. America has been top of the refining pack since the start of the oil age in the mid 19th century. But China will dethrone the U.S. as early as next year, according to the International Energy Agency. Earlier this month, Royal Dutch Shell pulled the plug on its convent refinery in Louisiana. In 1967, the year convent opened, the U.S. had 35 times the refining capacity of China. Unlike many oil refineries shut down in recent years, convent was far from being obsolete. It's fairly big by U.S. standards and sophisticated enough to turn a wide range of crude oils into high value fuels. Yet Shell, the world's third biggest oil major, wanted to radically reduce refining capacity and couldn't find a buyer. As Convent's 700 workers found out that they were out of a job, their counterparts on the other side of the Pacific were firing up a, a new unit in Rong, Rongsheng's petrochemicals giant Zhejiang complex in Northeast China. Hopefully I pronounced that right. It's just one of at least four projects underway in the country, totaling 1.2 million barrels a day of crude processing capacity, equivalent to the UK's entire fleet. The COVID crisis has hastened a seismic shift in the global refining industry as demand for plastics and fuels grows in China and the rest of Asia, where economies are quickly rebounding from the pandemic. In contrast, refineries in the U.S. and Europe are grappling with a deeper economic crisis, while the transition away from fo fossil fuels dims the long-term outlook for oil demand. That's that a, is a big change. Dramatic. Yeah, that's a pretty dramatic shift in both uh, the recovery from COVID as well as the, the shift from um, refining from the U.S. to China. Yep, no doubt. Uh, recently, ChemPoint's been selected by the Kimors company for sales and distribution of its Viton fluoroelastomers in the United States and Canada. Notably, fluoroelastomers are used in molded and extruded mechanical seals as well as other products in various industries, including aerospace, automotive, chemical processing, industrial machinery, consumer electronics, and oil and gas. The trademark Viton fluoroelastomers are intended to bring consistent performance and durability in extreme conditions by helping products retain their flexibility, strength, shape, and seal. Comores is excited to expand its partnership with ChemPoint and leverage the business model, which is in lockstep with the quickly shifting needs of today's business climate. ChemPoint offers technical expertise across multiple industry segments, along with an understanding of customer needs to help bring marketing proficiency and reach to new markets and applications to support the growth of Viton fluoroelastomers. It's a great product and two great companies. Shell launches blue hydrogen technology. Shell Catalyst and Technologies, which licenses technologies and brings capabilities to market, has launched Shell Blue Hydrogen Process, which integrates proven technologies to significantly increase the affordability of greenfield blue hydrogen projects. The term blue hydrogen refers to hydrogen produced using fossil fuel resources with carbon emissions being captured and stored or reused. Currently, gray hydrogen production is most common. This is a fossil reliant production without emissions capture. Blue hydrogen production is relatively easy to scale up to meet demand according to Shell. Furthermore, when CO2 penalty of 25 to 35 bucks a ton is applied, blue hydrogen becomes more competitive against gray hydrogen. Shell's new Shell blue hydrogen process reduces the cost of hydrogen by 22% compared to processes currently on the market. It's a cool new technology. Yeah, very cool. In more sustainability news, DSM and Neste partner to produce po polymers from sustainable feedstock. Royal DSM will start a strategic partnership with Neste, producer of rene renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel to produce high performance polymers. This will enable DSM and its customers to reduce the carbon footprint of their own products while also supporting the industry to transition to a circular economy, according to the company. In the new strategic collaboration, DSM engineering materials 
will start replacing a significant portion of the fossil feedstock used in the manufacture of its polymers portfolio with feedstock produced from recycled waste plastics and or 100% bio-based hydrocarbons. Another good story on sustainability. Now we, we see all these stories every week come out about these new products and sustainable processes. Hopefully these things really take off and they're the future. Yeah, I agree. All right, and in food ingredient news, Barry Calabout has started a new eco initiative to upcycle its cocoa shells into biochar, which looks similar to charcoal, supplies green energy and reduces carbon emissions as the chocolate and cocoa giants operations. This is an industry first project that sees the transformation of cocoa byproducts into biochar, dubbed agriculture's black gold. The company's forever chocolate strategy is all about making sustainable chocolate the norm by 2025. The energy being released by the very efficient pyrolysis process of turning cocoa shells into biochar will be reused for, for steam production, thus creating green energy. This energy will be used to help power facilities. I'm cuckoo for biochar. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> DSM boosts portfolio with new enzyme for lactose-free dairy products. Royal DSM is bolstering its lactase portfolio with a new one-stop shop enzyme for regular and organic lactose-free dairy products. Similar to DSM's other high-performing lactases, it also supports producers in delivering sought-after sought sugar-reduced options. The launch of Maxilact Super Lactase Enzyme enables dairy manufacturers to create high-quality, clean-tasting, lactose-free, and sugar-reduced dairy, notes the Dutch multinational. The popularity of the lactose-free dairy category continues its upward trajectory, propelled by the rising number of consumers choosing lactose-free varieties for their perceived health appeal. All right, moving on to M&A news. Salve has reached an agreement with Latour Capital to sell its technical grade barium and strontium business in Germany, Spain, and Mexico, as well as its sodium percarbonate business in Germany. Salve's barium and strontium business includes a joint venture with Chemical Products Corporation, which is part of the transaction. The agreement is a key step towards streamlining Salve's portfolio while reducing the group's footprint by exiting its position in niche technical grade chemical, chemical markets. I think that's the, the second story we've heard recently of Salve uh, selling off one of its more technical businesses. All right, in other news, um, Ineos announced that it's agreed to work with Sasol North America to acquire its 50% membership interest in the Gemini HDPE for four point, or excuse me, $404 million. Gemini is a toll manufacturer of bimodal high density polyethylene products serving rapidly growing pipe and film markets. Gemini is operated by Enios and located within the Enios Battleground Manufacturing Complex in LaPorte, Texas. The proposed acquisition, which is contingent on financing, is targeted to close by year end and would consolidate 100% of Gemini ownership and all marketing under Enios. All right, and that's it for this week's edition of Industry Reactions. Um, as always, we will return next week with a fresh batch of stories and industry reactions. Until then, Stay safe. Take care.